uh, they, they say that following the defeat by the Crusader armies by Saladin, they talk about the, the, about the danger of being attacked at the time of Saladin. You know, to us, you know, the Crusades seemed a long time ago, doesn't it? Not very relevant to us. Remember where during the early years of the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, uh, President George W. Bush briefly referred to the war on terror as a crusade and got a terrible response in the Islamic world because the crusade is not something that seems historically a long way away to them. I remember when I taught at Baylor 20 some years ago and occasionally you would see someone re refer to the Civil War and uh, an, an elderly faculty w member would say, you mean the war of northern aggression. Well, the crusade takes on the same kind of feeling but with much greater resonance in the Arab world because of all the decades in which Arab countries lived under the domination of the French or the British or now then the American oil companies. And that's why to them something so old seems so present. Just as Begin labeled the British as Nazis, Hamas labeled Israel and its supporters as, I'm quoting, Nazi-like enemies. Just like Begin said that their heroes were reborn, Hamas says that the jihad uh, fighters were reborn. And just as for Be I didn't quote this, but Begin, Begin paraphrases Descartes. You know, Descartes famous statement, except what he says is, we fight, therefore we are. And the Palestinians say something very, very similar in all of, in, in all of their charter. They say, Allah is the goal, the prophet is the model, the Quran is its constitution, jihad its path, and death for the cause of Allah would be his most sublime belief. There is no solution to the Palestinian problem except for jihad. We fight, therefore we are. There is no solution to the Palestinian problem except for jihad. For the Israelis, if you believe, if you believe in the revisionist mythology, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria in their mythic statements, those were the holy sites where most of the events of the Old Testament happened along with Jerusalem. But the Palestinians see the same land as holy to them. If you believe in the revisionist narrative, the famous, the famous statement was a, people with, uh, a land without a people for a people without a land. Except in fact, the ancient Zionists were wrong. There was a people. They didn't define themselves as Palestinians then. They defined themselves as southern Syrians, but they were there living there. It was not a land without a people. Palestinians erase the identity and deny, even today you hear many Palestinians deny that there is any identity. There are no Zionists. You, we hear that. The, the, only, the only good news internationally recently is that, that this was President Ahmadinejad's last speech at the United Nations this year, which I do think is fortunate, <laughs> since he always denies that there are any legitimate Zionists, any legitimate Israelis. The way I've described it, you understand why we haven't made peace, don't you? This isn't about a pragmatic deal. This is not about the Chicago teachers' strike. And you, many times you, you hear people on American television talk about it like that. Well, we just need to get them in the room and get them to make a deal. Yes, and, and, if, and if we could get Allah and, uh, and Moses in the room too, maybe it would be easier. <laughs> because we need their agreement on the land deal. David and I talk about an idea called mythic rectification. And this is the idea that myth systems over time can change. They can be modified. They don't always have to go to the end of the line. And I want to tell you that there is some good news. The good news is that there has been the beginning of some mythic rectification by both the revisionists and by Hamas, although you certainly don't hear much about that. The revisionist myth, when Begin was originally the leader of revisionism in the 1950s, he said that the Israeli state included both the West Bank and the East Bank of the Jordan River. This was an inconvenient argument, as Al Gore would say, because the East Bank of the Jordan River 
and the West Bank for that matter at that time, were called the State of Jordan, still are the State of Jordan. Begin gradually stopped the demand of the East Bank because it was not feasible, it was not possible. He gradually stopped talking about that. Similarly, Ehud Olmert, a truly great man who was Prime Minister of Israel, he wasn't the leader of revisionism at that point, although he had been a revisionist all his life, and he came to recognize that for Israel to survive into the long term, the myth needed to be rectified. He said in 2006, the existence of a Jewish majority in the state of Israel cannot be maintained with the continued control over the Palestinian population in Judea, Samaria, and the Gaza Strip. We firmly stand by the historic right of the people of Israel to the entire land of Israel. Every hill in Samaria, every valley in Judea is part of our historic homeland. We do not forget this, not even for a moment. However, the choice between the desire to allow every Jew to live ever, anywhere in the land of Israel to the existence of the state of Israel as a Jewish country obligates relinquishing parts of the land of Israel. Olmert knew that if Israel is going to be safe, surrounded by a hundred million Arabs, who hate, hate Israel's existence. The only way was peace. It's that same judgment that got Yitzhak Rabin killed, but remember, not by a Palestinian terrorist, by an Israeli terrorist. He was ready to make peace, a hard peace. And similarly, you, although you rarely hear this, there have been signs that Hamas is changing, at least some. The, the, the head of Hamas said in 2009 of the Hamas chapter, charter, ignore the Hamas charter. It's a 20-year-old document that was shaped by Palestinian experiences. And he admitted that he declared the movement was seeking a state only in the areas Israel won in 1967. Experts who've studied Hamas say that the goal of Hamas is to find a political path that would allow it to coexist with Israel without jettisoning, jettisoning its ideological moorings. And so we are at an impasse because the extremists on each side absolutely control the process. If the Israeli government starts to make signs of peace, the Israeli right will protest and then the there will be a response of a bombing from the Palestinian side in, in response to what the, terror what the settlers have done. If the Palestinian side makes peace, tries to make movements toward peace, precisely the same thing will happen in reverse. We have to find a way to rectify the two mythic systems. And, and I want to make the point that mythic rectification is not impossible. That you need to take steps that recognize the peoplehood of the other side. One thing that began with Menachem Begin was suddenly leaders in the Israeli establishment and leaders in the Palestinian establishment spent a lot of time together and they discovered that they were reasonable, simps, you know, smart people, concerned about their own people, but with families of their own. They weren't the two-headed terrorists of their own mythic language. The other thing that needs to be happen is you have to have tangible support from the United States and the West in general that nudges both people and supports a better life for the Palestinians. This will take, it's, a, it's remember I, I quoted Clinton as saying a piece of the brave, he was quoting Yasser Arafat when he said that, well, we really need a piece of the brave right now from Bibi Netanyahu. And, and one more thing, the, least, the thing that is least helpful is threats from one side or the other because threats always produce the mythic reaction. There certainly is much reason for pessimism. When Prime Minister Netanyahu came and spoke in the United States and to IPAC, the American-Israel Political Action Committee, and then again in Congress, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict barely was mentioned. Uh, if President, if uh, Governor Romney is elected, he has basically said he would out outsource uh, Middle Eastern policy to the Israelis. You can imagine how well received that will be in the the 90 some percent of the Middle East that is not Israel. And yet, and certainly, you know, 
the Hamas is willing to, to say one thing to the West, but another thing in Gaza. That, that is a reason for real pessimism. Tom Friedman, the New York Times columnist, op-ed columnist, often says, if, if I hear the leaders of Hamas saying the same thing in Arabic that they're saying in English, I'll know we're on the verge of peace. We're not there yet. And yet, there is still reason for optimism. The reason for optimism is that in the long run, the only way out is the peace deal I've described. And there is something in it for both sides. Israel cannot remain a democratic state and a Jewish state without a compromise deal. It's simply impossible. Because of demography, the Palestinian population is growing so fast that in a relatively short period of time, without a deal, Israel be, will be forced to becoming a multi-ethnic democracy, no longer a Jewish state, or not a democratic state. It will be a choice between apartheid and Jewishness. And there's no way around that. There's just no way around it. Also in it for Israel is absent a deal, in the long run there is no security. The Palestinians, a deal means a chance to make a normal society. A normal society and peace. What a deal. So it may seem that peace is impossible, but I really think in the long run the logic of the argument is so powerful. If we just had uh, Yitzhak Rabin. Now I want to end by saying something about the United States. That extremist rhetoric that got said about Rabin did it sound like things that crazy right-wingers say sometimes about President Obama? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That he's a Kenyan Marxist terrorist? <laughs> yes. I don't know about you, but that scares me. <laughs> you know, there are, believe me, they're crazy, they're crazy leftists too, although they're mostly in humanities departments and major research universities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, you, know, you, know, you know the joke that there, you know, where there's only three places you find Marxists in the world today. There are a few left in Cuba and a few left in North Korea and, and there are a whole bunch left in anthropology and sociology <laughs> departments in, in the United States. That joke is not very far off. It really is true. But the extremist rhetoric on the right, and there is extremist rhetoric on the left, it's just, you know, how, how, impact, how much impact can an academic have, is, scares me because it sounds in my ears so much like things that were said about Yitzhak Rabin. Barack Obama, you can say everything you want to say about his policy is not working and you know, I think there's an argument there. But he's not a Kenyan Marxist terrorist. <laughs> That's just crazy. But crazy people do things. And you think, well that's extremist. It's only in running for president eight years ago maybe it's 10, 12 years ago, when, when, when Pat Buchanan used a single word to define the entire immigration problem. He said we needed to define, we needed to d deal with the problem of Jose. <laughs> Defining all people with brown skin as illegal immigrants. Instead of many Hispanic Americans of many generations of American citizenship which is the truth. Some, some in New Mexico before the United States was the United States. Those words scare me. And so I want to say to you that we need to make, we maybe need quite a lot of mythic rectification in our own country so that we can talk to each other and reason with each other as President Johnson famously said. Well, thank you so much. Okay. I wonder, I was thinking about um, what you said about the West needing to nudge. Do you think as long as our leaders there continue to verbalize mainly our support in the Ring of Israel, that that nudge is ever going to work for the Palestinian folks? Or do you think we need to, to straddle a more neutral line for that nudge to work? Well, you know, I, I kind of think, uh, you know, Obama's been criticized a lot. He, they say he, he screwed up. Um, and he's also been criticized because he has such poor relations with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, to me, 
poor relations with Prime Minister Netanyahu make perfect sense, since Netanyahu, there, we have had opportunities to have serious negotiations for peace that are demonstrably in Israel's interest, that would protect Israel, and Netanyahu has done things that make having those negotiations almost impossible. Uh, and he's done those things because they're politically popular in Israel. Well, how courageous. Um, so I, I kind of think that... Um, now, I do think this is one area where if you want to nudge the two sides, you know, if, if that's your most important issue, that's something that I think President Obama is... You know, Mitt Romney has said basically that he thinks the conflict is hopeless and that he would support Israel no matter what. Um, I, I, that, you know, you never know. One hopes for the best. But I kind of think the Obama administration uh, was kind of doing the right thing in putting pressure on Israel. You know, it hasn't worked yet, but I don't really see much other option, to be totally honest. See, I agree with you, but then it seems last week, wasn't it last week when he came out and reaffirmed support for Israel? Like, I assume those exact, uh, exact words. Well, uh, which one? Obama? Obama, but I think Obama was talking about the context of Iran, and Iran really is, I mean, Iran does have a leadership that is mythically driven, um, you know, and you understand why the Israelis would be very concerned about an Iranian nuclear weapon. Uh, I also, if you, I've not been asked this, but I mean, I, everything I know says an Israeli or American uh, preemptive attack on Iran is unlikely to work and likely to make things much, much worse. But it's still a hard situation. Uh, I think actually, uh, the, I was just reading in the New York Times yesterday that the best experts think that an Israeli or American attack probably would speed up Iran getting nuclear weapons for two reasons, because they would not stop till they had one, and secondly, because a lot of countries that are supporting embargoes against them would stop supporting those embargoes if we attacked. And that makes sense to me. It is unfortunately way too complicated to explain in something like a presidential debate. Um, and that's, that's uh, well... A topic I'll discuss a little bit tonight, but so I mean, you know, if you want to, if you want to point to dangers, they are sure out there. That one really, that one really scares me, to be honest. We have time for one more. Anybody? Um, what procedures or steps do you think would be necessary to implement this verbal filter that you basically alluded to? That would be necessary for proper communication between the two. And how would you say we should, if any, if at all, even assist with that implication? Or, well, I think, you know, getting the technocrats talking to each other, the, some of the things that have happened quietly during the Obama administration, you know, there's been quite a lot of reform of the Palestinian Authority because they've had a technocratic leader, and, uh, and, and he has shut down some of the essentially militia-like elements within the Palestinian Authority, take, uh, strengthen the police. The police have been tra trained by the American military, so the police are acting as independent. It's, there was considerable progress that was made on strengthening the Palestinian Authority as an ec economically, which strengthened the moderates. You know, and this is one of these instances where the, uh, Netanyahu has, on several occasions, cut off funding for the Palestinian Authority, which is, you know, all that does is support, support the elements, the more radical elements, and harms the more centrist elements. So we have, to, we, have, we have to have essentially support the elements that create contact between the peoples, that break down the barriers, and that build up the elements of the Palestinian state. Uh, that so so that you know you, you've got to give the Palestinian if you want the Palestinians to make peace you got to give them something to lose by going to war again and you got to give them something to gain in the future and 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 we should we should continue you know the Obama administration has tried to do those things you know I. You got a great. You got a great on a big curve when you talk about the Middle East because this is the hardest thing in the world to do, and they've tried to do the right thing. The one thing I would do, I do think I've heard several people say this: if if Obama is reelected, I would ask former President Clinton to personally take control of these negotiations because he is still a quite beloved figure on both sides. And you know, I think we learned the guy's still pretty good at talking too. <laughs> yeah. Plus, there are no internship programs over there, so he, he'd be safe. <laughs>